I found this a very unexpected surprise. I had no idea about this movie. I knew nothing. And what I loved about it is first off, I think Aaron Pierre, he was amazing for this role. I would like to see what he does next. If he goes full into action movies, I would not blame him because he was freaking awesome in this. And I can 100% see him as a superhero at some point. And I want to point out a couple roles here, Ricky Flex. There's one obvious one. John Stewart. Yep. Or Lanterns. Although Too obvious. Aaron Pierre is very serious in Rebel Ridge. And I think they're looking for a John Stewart that will go against a more mature and older Hal Jordan, maybe a more immature John Stewart. But I also was thinking, hey, if Mahershala Ali dips from Blade, we got a young Blade that can play it for a long time and that can clearly do all the action stunts required. All right, so this guy, Aaron Pierre, right? I'm watching this movie, this first scene. Right? Everyone's talking about like the first scene a lot. Um, I'm like, I know this guy. Huge, jacked, piercing blue eyes. It's like, I know this guy. And like, I'm like, where do I know him from? So I do a quick INDB per TDI uh, usual. And I'm like, he was an old M. Night Shyamalan? And I was like, holy crap. He was like the rapper on the beach where the, the doctor was racist to on the beach. Oh my gosh. I don't even, I barely remember him, but you're right. He has that distinct eye, the, those distinct eyes. Yes. That, that's, the giveaway. that's why he'd be great for Jon Stewart too. And he has a great voice, uh, like uh, RIP James Earl Jones, like <laughs> a shout out. But um, he has a great voice. He's going to be, and I'm checking his IMDb. I was like, oh, like checking his upcoming. Cause like clearly this guy, the one consensus thing, you can say this movie's great. You can say this movie's bad, whatever. But the one like consistent thing from this movie is that Aaron Pierre is a future star. If not, he he's here, you know? And I'm like, all right, what's, what's he got upcoming? Right. Dude, this guy's voicing Mufasa in the Barry Jenkins movie coming oh out in gosh. December. On yeah. this episode to have Rebel Ridge and then also have a, in memoriam for James Earl Jones, it feels almost too serendipitous. This was fate, Ricky Flex. Yeah, and again, Barry Jenkins directing Mufasa, and obviously James Earl Jones, Mufasa, like you just mentioned. And I was looking at the IMDb, Barry Jenkins, I totally forgot, did a prime se limited series, Underground Railroad, and who starred in that was Aaron Pierre. So mm -hmm. the Barry Jenkins connection, great voice, now Mufasa. Everything's starting to click, right? Everything's starting to make sense. So I, I, you can say what you want about this movie, but you cannot say he was bad in this. He was very good in this. And big things ahead for him. For him. I, I know we're typecat. We're, we're, we're saying, everyone's saying Jon Stewart because, oh, as a clear superhero, that would make sense. Blade, if Mar some of Mar Mar Marshala Ali, that makes sense. I was actually thinking, remember the, the Superman, J.J. Abrams Superman, we said Michael B. Jordan? This yeah. guy would be great. Um, but yeah, this guy, Aaron Pierre, keep an eye out for him. There's going to be a big announcer coming next six months, whether it's superhero or big blockbuster movie, something, there's going to be some huge news with this guy starting because he has this breakout performance as in like a lot of eyeballs on him. He's going to be Mufasa. So obviously people are going to start seeing his name as the top billing in that movie. One of the top billings there. Watch out for this guy. So I think he was like number one on why people saw like loved this movie there's a lot of fans of this movie or at least liked it like they're saying the core of this movie the anchor of this movie was clearly up to the task and what's interesting is that he was pretty much the third choice like i told you it was it was a very tumultuous production i'm sure you were already aware ricky flex john boyega was supposed to be the lead of this movie and he went even into a hotel was going to be on set very soon and then he backed out apparently according to reports I do want to say, Ricky Flex, I think John Boyega could have done this role, but I do want to say I was thinking about this. I'll get my Colin Coward bag for a sec. If John, I can see John Boyega doing this, but it's almost like when you see a six foot three, super jack guy at the gym and think that this guy can throw a football. You know, I what I mean is you you see that jack guy in the gym, great build. He looks like he's Justin Herbert. But then he's too muscular, and he, you find out he hasn't been a football player his entire life, and he's not actually coordinated. Like, John Boyega has done things that we've been impressed with, but could he do the action star anchor type of role like Aaron Pierre did? 
we have to see it to believe it. You know, I would presume he can do it, but I am not 100% sure. I know for a fact, Aaron Pierre, he can pull this off. And I can't say John Boyega would have been better, but I think he could have done something similar. If that makes sense, Ricky. It makes sense. So I guess a little back, a little bit more on the backstory. When they first started production with John Boyega, it was in 2021. It was three years ago. It was so long ago. And yeah. I guess, like, I read something that they actually filmed with John Boyega. Maybe that was incorrect. But I actually thought they actually filmed, like, m- several scenes already. And he had to leave during production because he had a uh, family death or family reasons, something like that. So it was a good reason why he had to leave. It's not like he pulled up freaking Joaquin Phoenix on Todd Haynes here. No, no, no. That's not what happened. But I agree with you. I think this was a much better pick. And especially looking like at Jack Reacher, uh, just recently watched Jack Jack Reacher, like that big, this had that Jack Reacher feel, you know, this like nomad like person, like with like clearly some like background of holy crap, this guy is like, he means business. He's like, sure, he might be a lone wolf, but he's like a John Wick boogeyman type of person. He has that aura around where John Boyega, I don't see that. You know, you just and it also might be because he's too well known. I think right? so too. That's he's too the thing. well known. This guy was in Star Wars for God's sakes. Um, I think here having that Jack Reacher like unknown unknowingness of Aaron Pierre, it's like, oh, like I don't know, like I, I think it worked really well. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say it helps because the bookends are so good of this movie. The middle I think hits a lull. But the beginning, you have no idea what this person's capable of. You don't know his background. You don't know. You assume he had military experience, but they kind of throw you for a loop saying he's never been deployed and he's, quote, never been in a street fight. That's because you also don't know Aaron Pierre. And so it's going to be kind of a little bit of a shock factor. And you're hanging on pins and needles to see what this guy's capable of. I think that actually helped the movie. Yeah, the the, the no street fighting was interesting because I think he actually did a great job acting throughout the fight scenes, whereas like clear he's never been in a fight at some points, especially in the third act. It was very, it was, I actually thought it was a really good acting uh, during, Mm -hmm. and not just like action acting, like as in the fight sequences, but also acting during them because you you could tell like he was hesitating at points. Like I thought that was really good writing and then also just the acting point of it. Um, But I will say, there were times, especially at the middle hour of this movie, where I was like, we need more at, like fighting. And I kind of wish it was more like a Jack Reacher, John Wick, um, like extraction, where it's just like, this guy is the best at what he does. Jiu-jitsu, martial arts expert. He has fought a zillion guys, and he's never lost. Like I, I, We all love those type of movies where these boogeymen are just like, they are the best of the best. No one can touch them, and they've proven it. And they have that aura, of course, like like Aaron Pierre has, but also it's like they say it like everyone else like finds out who they are through other people. You know, the legend of Aaron Pierre, the legend of Jack Reacher, the legend of John Wick. You know, we live for that. You know, those theories are like, oh, I've killed a guy with a pencil. We love that stuff. I think like I think it worked for like as in like it worked well, him not being in a fight and stuff. But at the end of the day, with these type of movies, I want to see more action sequences, especially that middle hour, and I want to see that legend build and build throughout the movie. And we didn't really get that here, but I still like the movie. After I watched this, I thought about immediately, we can see a sequel potentially happening. And this kind of has like elements that we love out of great revenge action thriller franchises. You know, I think one thing that really stuck out to me and I thought was a really cool scene was when he has that phone call with Mr. Liu from the Chinese restaurant and you finally get to go to the Chinese restaurant, you find out he was fighting in the Korean War, the guy who's taking care of him, he was a nurse, and then he also is taking care of him. He fought for the Chinese in the Korean War. So uh, you had a nice spin there and you had something unexpected, but it's like almost like where you have that assistant, you know, like the guy who's going to wrap up John Wick in Parabellum. Like you have Alfred for Batman. Like this had that element. It had some great one-liners, especially with the one-on-one sequences with Don Johnson, who I thought was also very good in this movie. We'll Um, talk to him later. But like the isms go on and on where it's like the refusal to kill, you know, it's like that reminded me of Batman Mm. along with, um, the elements, even Reacher. when you go like the second in command to like a Don Johnson with the, I think it's Emery, Emery Johnson. Is that the guy's name? Emery, Emery Jones, I think. Emery Jones. 
him as like the next guy up, almost unkillable, but supremely evil, you know, type of character that just looms and you can't seem to get rid of. I think that's another reason why people are really latching onto this because this movie reminds them of so many other movies, you know? And I think also you, it, like you talked about inspirations that it may have had, like to me, this was like a Neo Western. I saw inspirations from like wind river in this movie, you know, I like the corrupt town. You have like the, the standoff at the end of the movie, you got like the John wick vibes, revenge thriller. I thought a Rambo the entire time, but they did a nice spin where this guy's never actually seen action, you know? So I thought, Aaron Pierre, number one, that's why people are seeing, like, are loving this movie. And two, it's because it reminds them of other great movies and it's adopted so well. It is kind of like a puzzle of great action movies. And that's why I think, I think the director here, uh, do you have the guy's name? The director? Yes, it's uh, Jeremy Solnier. Sonier? Uh, I think it's French. God, I cannot pronounce it. But I think it's Sonier. And I think he did a good job like taking these puzzle pieces of these great franchise movies and making them making a coherent story, a tight story when it could have gone awry. It's a Netflix movie for God's sake. So it could have gone haywire, Ricky. Oh God. Yeah. We've seen Netflix movies get off the rails and get too big, right? We get too big for their bridges. Right. Um, by the way, not Don Johnson. The second in command is Emery Cohen. Cohen. Um, and he's remember like, that he, name. People are saying like next Paul Walter Hauser. I can't unsee it after hearing. That. I know. And like looking at the, uh, the images on Google, it's like this guy is like a Paul Walter Hauser type. It's like this guy could have easily easily played Richard Jewell. That's what I, I say. I'm like, that's Richard Jewell. Um, he was in a Place Beyond the Pines as the kid. Okay. Uh, the, so, the friend of Dan DeHaan, or maybe the yeah. friend. Yeah. At the end, third act. Yeah, he's like, yeah, he's like the friend. I haven't seen I it in a while. Sorry. I know, but he, he's the other kid, that other main kid. But um, he was very good in this, clearly, and. God, the, the director here, also writer, hasn't done a lot, but he's done this, and he's done Green Room, again, neo-Nazi type of movie, action movie as well, obviously different, but he's clearly, like, he can do this, and sp- also, I just want to say, just related to him, he's another person to keep an eye on, similar to Aaron Pierre, because he's done Green Room, he's done this, clearly on a hot streak, but you know what else he did just this year? True Detective Night Country. But which episodes did he direct? The best episodes, one and two. So the ones where we were like, maybe the show's going to be really good. Really good. And obviously that turned out to be what it was. But for me, this guy's also another guy to keep an eye on. It'll be interesting to see like what path he goes on, where he's going to, is he going to do more of the action path? Um, like a Fast and Furious direction. Who's the director in that? James, uh, sorry. Justin Lin. Justin Lin, like he's going to be a Justin Lin. Or, again, this movie, although it's not original because it has, like, the Western vibes, it has the Revenge Thor vibes, but it also has, like, that, you know, it has, like, the the major themes of deep-rooted racism, corrupt uh, uh, society, police system, a structure behind it. So he is, like, diving into deeper themes, and, like, they blend pretty well. And he, he tries to do a conspiracy theory type of story that I think isn't as good. But I feel like he could try to do things that are more cutting edge, uh, that are bigger than this, as in more like topical, that won't be movies that we just suddenly that suddenly drop on Netflix and we're like, oh, this movie comes out. I'll check it out. It's like, no, no, you'll be hearing this guy writing, directing a movie that we will be talking about in the most anticipated top billing. Yeah, this is a different approach from Netflix, or at least it's a different um, it has different parameters than most Netflix movies where it it loses the a-lister it goes with someone just better suited for the role it appears and it goes with um a non-franchise movie it's not a sequel potentially could become a franchise but just leans on the director and just leans on the concept trusting the director usually don't see this type of stuff from netflix so i was impressed ricky flex uh this is there's got to be some podcasts that do movies and they try and find niches. You know, we love to report movie news and talk about trailers and then review on certain days, but there's got to be like a movie podcast. That's like strictly Netflix, you know, like new Netflix movies, like, cause there's so many people that are so devoted to that streaming service and they probably review so many shit movies. And then all of a sudden rebel Ridge, which has zero promotion. Then all of a sudden they get hit with a bang. Maybe they even take the week off saying like, yeah, this, this is gonna, This is going to be a, a zero of a week. And then they get the Aaron Pierre performance and they get 
of what I would say probably my what it would make my top ten movies of the year so far. Wow. Rebel Ridge. Okay. All right. Two things. I have a question for you after that. One, if this dropped on Apple TV Plus, like no one's seeing this. Exactly. And I yeah. think Apple TV Plus has quality that's this or better in TV shows that get zero promotion that they just drop like this. And it's just like no one ever watches them, right? But because it's Netflix and they have the scale, they have the subscribers, they have the the cash, uh, everything, right? Like they could just like do this where they could just drop this movie on you. And like Don Johnson's Don Johnson, Miami Vice, like older generation loves Don Johnson, right? Uh, James Cromwell, well-established actor here. I know he's not in it a lot, but you see his face is like, that, that's James Cromwell, older generation too. It's like, you're going to get eyeballs on this just because it's on Netflix and it has recognizable faces. Even the girl in this and Sophia Robb, I had to look up her name, early 2000s, Bridget Terabithia. I knew it was her, dude. I didn't look it up. I literally thought about it as you were saying it. I'm like, she was definitely Bridget Terabithia. Yes. Yes. So it's just like you have these recognizable faces and Aaron Pierre, like we talked about, who has a great performance. It's like, yeah, people are going to watch this movie on Netflix. Now, my second thing, and I, this question to you, you said this makes your top 10 of the year. Yeah. Is this better than They Clone Tyrone from last year, which was, again, a sudden drop on Netflix over Bar Barbenheimer Weekend, John Boyega? I think it is, you know, and I like that's because it kind of fits my vibe. I was watching this late at night. I stopped it after an hour, after after one night, turned it on the next night, and it was like something great to watch before I went to bed. I would it, it, like what my ultimate test is: did it keep me awake? This movie did. They cloned Tyrone. I don't know if that would keep me awake. You know, I think it has some good performances from Boyega, Tayona Paris, but. That movie is so forgettable. Rebel Ridge seems to have a sticking point with people right now. I could see myself if there's a sequel. I think there should be a sequel because Netflix movies are so forgettable when they drop on here. I think they just got to take advantage of momentum right now. I think a sequel would happen for this movie, you know, if they are smart. And I think that's going to give me a reason to return to it. You know, cool. I just it's it's more my vibe. Yeah, Revenge Thrower, Neo Western understand why you would pick this. The Clone Tide Rone is like, just a, a little freaky. It's just a little freaky of a movie. I know, but I, I love that movie. Especially as a comedy. Like, if you're going in the genre of before you go to bed, that does keep me awake. Especially with the stars and it's it's con that concept. It is freaky, but it keeps you intrigued. And Siona Paris is fantastic. And Jamie Foxx is fantastic in it. I, I do give that movie the edge, but that neither here nor there. Um, Will this movie get a sequel? Netflix already called them and said, let's do a sequel. Let's just clear the dude, air there. It's, dude, this is like, there's no box office to measure Netflix, but the social media attention Rebel Ridge is getting warrants a sequel. To, to them, like social media cachet is box office. This, so I think you make a sequel. Yeah, and like they definitely, like the viewership numbers that they have, this is definitely doing well just because everyone's talking about it, right? Everyone's seeing this movie. Um, but my take is, if Aaron Pierre is smart, he, sh he wouldn't do a sequel. He wouldn't get tied down to Netflix. Exactly. Because he doesn't want to be a Netflix star. I don't think, like, he has, he has Barry Jenkins. Like, Barry Jenkins clearly loves this guy. Use that, leverage that, and start going, going around tour with other great directors. You know? You did your thing here. You apparently were great in Underground Railroad. I did not watch it. But I heard he was good. Not a lot of people watched it. Uh, spoiler alert. So it's like, hey, like now's the time to start getting out there. Maybe it is time to do a superhero movie, get more eyeballs on you. All right. Or just do a bigger movie, a Barry Jenkins movie in theaters where you're actually playing an actual character and like one of the leads. That would be like his next step. Not doing another the same role, same exact revenge thrower. That is not the, the formula. Look at Chris Hemsworth. Like, Besides, if like he didn't have Thor and he was just extraction, he would be a Netflix guy. You don't want to be that, right? You want to be like if he wants to like keep ascending in his career, just utilize like leverage Barry Jenkins, try to get up the ladder throughout Hollywood, not through Netflix. I I'm not his agent, but I think he should choose another project and then do a sequel to Rebel Ridge. Like, come on, like you, you can't ignore this is potentially the star making turn. Right, don't forget your roots, where you came from, and Netflix is going to throw you a bag. What kind of like actor are you trying to be? 
if you are going to be an action superhero type of actor, you're going to make this sequel at some point. You know, it just depends what he wants to do. Yeah. And I like, and I think he's so good at this role. I mean, if he nails it and knocks it out of the park again, like you could potentially make a trilogy with this character and that you almost would found, find so unexpected. It would be such an accomplishment if you took a role from John Boyega and the person that was after John Boyega, and then you turned it into one of Netflix's biggest hits, franchises-wise, movies-wise, where they're so desperate. Yeah, if he wants to be an action like star, like, uh, I don't know, like a... Uh... God, not like Vin Diesel, but you know, like strictly act like Keanu Reeves almost. Instead of like Chris Hemsworth with, with Extraction, you know, I think yeah, that like would then, be yeah, similar. Yeah, clearly route. you do a sequel, you keep riding this wave, and you you make money, you get a lot of eyeballs on you still, but just in a different capacity, and the quality, the critical quality is just not going to be ever like the, the ceiling is just lower in those type of movies, and you're acting. That's fine. That's totally acceptable. That's still awesome. But like, he, he's working with Barry Jenkins, for God's sakes. I'm thinking he, that's not what he wants. I feel like he wants a combo type of career. Yeah. No, I, I don't disagree with you. I'm just saying, like, I think you can do something even more with this character. I think people want to see you. There's a craving for the audience to see this character again from Aaron Pierre. Clearly. Uh, I also think he pulled off a lot of the scenes without the action sequences. I think him one-on-one -on -one with Don Johnson, I thought he was funny. I thought he really embodied the character. I thought that he and Don Johnson had a great one-on-one. -on -one. You could have really easily taken the easy way out with a Don Johnson, like leader of a corrupt Southern town and just say he's racist. You know, I thought that actually was a pretty fleshed out character with the way they explained how the town works, the asset forfeitures that the cops were going for, trying to make sure money kept on coming into the town, right? Where it's like, you don't, like root for that character, but you find his motivation and it isn't what you typically see or is typically written, you know? And Don Johnson is like scary good at these type of roles. I think this late like renaissance he's had has been pretty good. When you look at Django, you look at Knives Out, you look at Rebel Ridge. I think he's doing some really cool stuff, late stage career that I think a lot of like former TV actors that were huge stars, like could use as a blueprint or template later yes. on. Yes. He's leaning into his voice. He has that like gruntal southern voice. Yeah. He's leaning into Miami Vice in a way, playing cops, right? Miami Vice detective here, a cop, Watchmen, cop, like like Watchmen TV show, like that's another example. Um, so yeah, he's, he's leaning into that. He has a distinct voice. You know, like he is aging very well now. He had a lull post Miami Vice. You know, 2000s, even like early 2010s, before Django in 2012, didn't really do a lot. Then 2012, Quentin Tarantino, come back, King. He's like, all right, you're Don Johnson. Be this big, be big daddy. Come in here, does that, and then he gets his little comeback. It's 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 pretty cool. So it's, I think you're right. This is a template for other people. Like obviously Quentin Tarantino, that's like a unique, 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 lucky situation. But for other, there's plenty of other directors that could do that and are looking for that. Just pick your like niche that like Don Johnson has and then run with it. Yeah, you know, you don't have to like do too much. Just find what your niche is. Find what your, you know, your comfort spot is. And he's freaking nailing it right now, you know. And his comfort zone is sort of douchebag, you know, but also like confident and also, you know, just like not a guy that you root for and that's okay if you're late stage character actor sometimes a villain i think we should give a score since, since we've talked about this movie so much ricky flex and i love how we did this spoiler free so you guys can watch it on netflix we didn't give away the ending we didn't really hit any i guess important plot points too in depth what do you give rebel ridge i give it a 79 out of 100 mm, okay i'm an 86 i'm an 86 what I do think the movie kind of got caught up with was explaining the corruption of the police force and trying to connect the dots with the cousin of Aaron Pierre's character. Like when they were doing that, I was just like, this is the part of the action movie that no one gives a shit about. So you got to make this more concise. You know, that's what you got to do and just chop it up a little bit. A score would have been higher if they actually cut apart some of those lulls that happened. But there's a bunch of great high-tension action sequences to this movie. Totally agree.